Hello, everybody. Welcome back to ATM5, Our Changing Atmosphere. In this lecture, we'll motivate why it's important to understand the Earth's system and our effect on it. In this section, the key questions being answered are, why is an understanding of the Earth's system and the effect of climate change important? And how is the Earth's system understood? The definitions today are climate experiments, climate observations, and climate models. Let's start off with our question. Why is an understanding of the Earth system and the effect of climate change important? Perhaps I'll rephrase. Why are you taking this class? What interests you about the science of climate change? Maybe you have a personal motivation, or more than likely, you've been personally affected by weather that has been linked to climate change. So take a moment, pause this video if you need to, and think about how you would answer this question. It is largely undisputable that humans are strongly linked to the natural world. At the most basic level, we need food, water, and air, all of which come from the natural environment. Our food supply comes from agriculture, which is highly dependent on weather. Water comes from reservoirs that are filled from precipitation and snowmelt, and we need clean air for us to thrive. But even beyond that, we are connected with the natural world. Mountain snowpack is needed to maintain montane ecosystems that are a key component of our national parks and enjoyed by people all around the world. Not only that, but snowpack is also needed to keep ski resorts open. The weather we experience is furthermore linked with our day-to-day -day activity. When summer temperatures are high, we need to turn on our air conditioners, which in turn affects energy demand and so energy generation. When extreme weather strikes, whether that be tropical cyclones, wildfires, heat waves, or droughts, there's a high risk of loss of life and resources. Climate, and in turn weather and our environment, are affected by climate change. And because the environment is so important to our day-to-day -day lives, it's essential that we understand how it is changing. This leads us to the fundamental motivation for this class. Essentially, our thesis statement, an understanding of regional and global change and global climate is one of the most important factors for long-term social and economic planning. As discussed last time, human activities are responsible for anthropogenic emissions and land use change. Our emissions fundamentally alter the chemistry of the atmosphere and change how energy flows through the Earth's system. This directly drives rising temperatures and shifting precipitation two ways in which we directly experience the environment every day. Global rising temperatures in turn drive sea level rise through melt of land ice and thermal expansion of the oceans. It increases the risk of heat extremes and wildfires. It also changes the phase of precipitation from snow to rain, which can affect water availability and drive up the risk of flooding. These indirect impacts drive local concerns with direct infrastructural costs. In Florida, sea level rise is increasing the salinity of their aquifers, making it increasingly difficult to provide fresh water to the population. Loss of snowpack affects water resources, changing the seasonality of stream flow and drives soil drying, which can in turn cause summertime ecosystem die-off. Changes in the temperatures of streams also affect fisheries, as fish spawning require at least certain cold temperatures of the water in order to thrive. Essentially, all sectors and stakeholders will be affected by climate change, but perhaps some of the most obviously impacted are shown in this figure. Let's now dive into some of these effects in more detail. The most direct effect of climate change is rising temperatures. This figure shows the five independently derived data sets of global temperatures as a departure from the 1850 to 1900 period, when temperatures were primarily naturally driven. We saw a shift into a slightly warmer regime in the 1930s that persisted to the 1970s. And in the 1970s, temperature increases took off, as can be seen in this plot. And they have been steadily increasing since. Today, we're seeing temperatures that are slightly over 1 degree Celsius or around 2 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than the 1850 to 1900 period. However, warming has not been uniform across the planet. The Arctic has been experiencing warming at more than twice the rate of the rest of the world. Temperatures over land have also been increasing faster than temperatures over the ocean. Temperature increases have also driven an increase in extreme heat. 
More and more of the continental U.S. has been experiencing unusually hot summer temperatures, particularly at nighttime, a trend that has been taking off since the 1990s. You can meet, read more about this extreme heat in this U.S. Environmental Protection Agency guidebook to extreme heat that's linked here. Increasing temperatures have also been driving the melt of land ice and thermal expansion of ocean water. As more water is added to the oceans, the ocean level rises. Also, as ocean water becomes warmer, much like hot air, it expands slightly and drives up ocean levels. Since water is a liquid, this effect tends to be small. But over thousands of feet of ocean depth, it can add up. This map shows the effect of sea level rise on the San Francisco Bay Delta. The dark red regions here are flooded under only three feet of additional sea level rise. This map shows the effect of sea level rise as being particularly severe or consequential for some of these regions around the San Francisco Bay Delta. The periphery of the bay is in particular danger from rising sea levels, but what is not known as well is that a large swath of the Bay Delta stretching all the way up to Sacramento Old Town is also relatively low-lying and has the potential of being flooded under rising seas. Three feet of sea level rise is actually a pretty typical estimate for, for what we will experience by 2100 under current warming rates. In California, average precipitation increases are expected to be relatively modest under climate change, on the order of about 5% over the next 30 years. However, ecosystems are affected by both temperature and precipitation. Taking a close look at Pine Grove, California, in the Sierra foothills outside Sacramento, we anticipate that the next century will see a shift from, temperature, from temperate forests to woodland slash shrubland. The temperate forests are shown here in the upper figure, and woodland shrubland is shown in the bottom figure. Obviously a big change in the landforms of these regions. Put simply, temperatures will be too high and soil too dry in order to support the large trees that we're used to in the Sierras. As a result, we anticipate there to be a transition to these shrublands in mid-century under current temperature trajectories. Under rising temperatures in Northern California, Northern California will start to look a lot more like Southern California. Perhaps the strongest reminders of our connection to the natural world come in the form of extreme weather. The most extreme of these events are catalogued twice each year by NOAA as billion dollar weather and climate disasters. Events which cause more than a billion dollars in anticipated damages. In 2019, the US experienced 14 such billion dollar disasters, ranging from wildfires to hailstorms, flooding, tornadoes, and tropical storms. Adjusted for inflation, the number of billion dollar disasters each year has been steadily increasing, along with the total cost. As of the end of June, 2020 has so far experienced $10 billion disasters, primarily from severe storms, and this completely neglects wildfires and tropical storms that we've experienced in September. You can check out more details of these events at the links shown here. Perhaps most recently, us in California have been affected by wildfires that have lit up essentially the entirety of the U.S. West. In, August, in this August 2020 satellite image from NASA, we see, that, we see smoke covering much of California, along with digitally ad added fire hotspots. Upper level smoke in the troposphere led to red skies across the U.S. West with some striking photos in particular around San Francisco Bay. As mentioned in our last lecture, the 2020 wildfire season has been record-breaking, with over 3.6 million acres burned, and six of the state's largest wildfires having occurred this year. So no doubt, the billion-dollar disasters that NOAA accounts for will be increasing this year. Climate change is directly increasing the risk of wildfire through loss of snowpack and soil drying. 2020 had an unusually dry spring and a heat wave that occurred in advance of the wildfire season. Both of these effects are related to increased temperatures and shifting precipitation patterns. Wildfires this year have also ignited, uh, were also ignited uh, by an uncommon lightning storm complex, although this cannot be a, is easily attributed to climate change. 
Nonetheless, studies of wildfire risk in the U.S. West have found that burn area is anticipated to increase between 200 and 500 percent in many areas for each degree Celsius increase in temperatures. Keep in mind, by the end of the century, we're anticipating an increase in global temperatures on the order of 3 to 5 degrees Celsius. As of 2016, a study in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences concluded that climate change has led to a doubling of the number of acres burned by wildfires in the U.S. West. Along the Gulf and Atlantic coasts, the past few years have also seen record-breaking tropical cyclones. Increases in air temperature have increased moisture content in the air and increased precipitation from these storms. This is perhaps the most obvious climate change linked impact associated with tropical cyclones. Hurricane Harvey in 2017 produced widespread and catastrophic flooding in Houston and surrounding areas as depicted here on the left. According to Harris County Flood Control District officials, Harvey caused the third 500 year flood in three years. For when it comes to flood planning, a 500 year flood is basically an event that is anticipated to occur only once every 500 years. So this is incredibly unusual that we have seen three such events occurring in such a short period of time. In 2020 so far, Hurricane Laura and Hurricane Sally have also led to widespread flooding, with little doubt that total rainfall is in part attributable to climate change. Warming not only affects air temperature, but also affects sea surface temperatures. Increases in sea surface temperatures have provided more fuel for these intense storms. We anticipate storms to be 2 to 11% more intense by 2100 because of these warmer sea surface temperatures. Storm frequency, on the other hand, doesn't have a monotonic signal, since more intense storms can disrupt the local environment and suppress the formation of subsequent storms. However, the Atlantic has seen an increase in storm count since 1980s, balanced by a decrease in the Western Pacific. We're going to talk more about tropical cyclones later in this class as well. A recent study out of Stony Brook published in 2018 estimated the effect humans have already had on tropical cyclones. In the case of Hurricane Florence, which lashed the Atlantic coast, climate change was attributed with increasing precipitation by 50% over a world without warming. Further, the diameter of the storm was estimated to be about 80 kilometers or 50 miles greater than the world without warming. To read more, you can check out the link here. Increases in precipitation isn't limited to just tropical cyclones. Flooding is also a common occurrence in California, but one that's generally driven by atmospheric rivers instead. These atmospheric rivers are long, narrow filaments of moisture that bring water from the subtropics into the mid-latitudes. When these events are at their most extreme in California, widespread flooding is experienced across the state as rivers and reservoirs overflow, such as we saw with the Oroville Reservoir a few years back. A sequence of atmospheric river events that hit the state in 1862 and drove premature melt of the Sierra Nevada snowpack caused widespread flooding throughout the Central Valley, including Sacramento. A recent study out of UCLA actually found that because of increased water vapor content in the air, there is roughly even odds, or about a 50% chance, that California and the Central Valley will experience a flood of this magnitude before 2050. In the central U.S., the 12 months prior to May 2019 were the wettest in 124 years of records. Extreme storms that moved in over May 2019 drove a 1 in 200 year flood event. Increased atmospheric moisture was again found to be a key driver in the severity of this event. There's a common rule of thumb when it comes to discussing climate change. Climate change makes wet, wetter, and dry, drier. To say that again, it makes wet, wetter, and dry, drier. Although it can be attributed to increased flooding, warmer temperatures and increased evaporation are also driving up drought risk. California recently experienced its worst drought on record, with essentially the entire state finding itself under drought conditions in 2015. California is generally well prepared for drought, as we have built up extensive infrastructure that allows us to more readily move water around the state. 
However, much of the wor underdeveloped and developing world in the tropics and subtropics regions are extremely vulnerable to drought. These are places without the needed infrastructure for dealing with dry conditions. You can see some of these regions highlighted in red in this figure. I hope that our discussion so far has been sufficient motivation on understanding why the Earth system and climate change are important. So how do we actually study the Earth system? In general, scientists use three main methods for studying the system. Experiments, observations, and models. Experiments are scientific procedures undertaken to test a hypothesis about the climate system. These experiments follow the scientific method. Intentional changes are made to input variables and outputs observed and quantified. A hypothesis made by those scientists is then tested to determine whether or not evidence supports or is contrary to the hypothesis. Observations, on the other hand, are passive snapshots of the climate system, taken either in situ, that is, in place, or with remote sensing, such as from satellites. NASA has a massive trove of climate observations because of a vast array of satellites that it has in orbit constantly looking down on the planet. This data is then collected and cataloged and analyzed to understand more about the behavior of the system. Most of this climate data can actually be accessed for free online through a simple Google search. Climate experiments could include understanding the response of atmospheric gases to radiation in a laboratory, for instance, to understand how carbon dioxide is more effective at trapping terrestrial radiation, uh, we can look at, in a laboratory, how a gas in a cylinder responds to uh, terrestrial radiation being emitted at it. We can also consider a climate experiment such as investigating the effect of organic and inorganic fertilizer on carbon storage in order to understand what the most effective means is for growing plants that can uptake carbon from the atmosphere. Climate observations could include atmospheric carbon dioxide concentration measurements, such as using time series from monitoring stations, mountain snow depth measurements, such as from satellites, flyovers, and pillow stations, or surface temperature and precipitation measurements from satellites or weather stations. With experiments and observational results in hand, scientists can build mathematical representations of the Earth system that capture fundamental laws of physics. These are known as climate models and can range from very simple calculations to massive multi-million line computer programs run on massive supercomputing systems. There are a number of such supercomputers available in the U.S. that have been used to effectively simulate the whole Earth. We can then test our understanding of the Earth system by seeing if these models are representative of what we see in the Earth system. Climate models, as computational reconstructions of the physical Earth system, can then be used to conduct experiments as well. We can increase carbon dioxide concentrations far beyond today's levels and see how that, re how that results in changes in the Earth system. We can add aerosols to the atmosphere or change the distance of the planet away from the sun. These type of experiments would be impractical or politically difficult in real life. Diagrammatically, this approach is laid out here. Experiments and observations constrain our climate modeling systems, which are used to conduct simulations and build up data sets of the Earth. With observations and simulation data sets in hand, we can analyze the data and inform stakeholders, policymakers, and students of the consequences of modifying the Earth's system. With this information in hand, these groups then have what they need in order to tackle solutions for both adaptation and mitigation of climate change. Okay, that's enough for today. Next time in ATM5, we'll be talking about the structure of the Earth's atmosphere.